Welcome to the New Day Community Church Sermon Podcast. We hope you are encouraged by this message from the Nichols Road Campus. For more info, look us up at newdaycommunity.org. Hey guys, I'm home. <laughs> good to be here, good to be with you. We're going through the book of Philippians, a letter written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison to the church in Philippi. And uh, this is called an expository series where we go basically verse by verse and just follow the flow of the scripture um, through the letter that was written. Last week, I thought Kathy Spaulding did a phenomenal job uh, teaching through that section. Uh, In fact, uh, I was like, I couldn't have gotten through that section because it's so rich and thick and, and it would take, I could spend a whole year just on that one uh, passage, but she just did such a good job with that. And, uh, um, <clears throat> and at the, the, uh, the section, if you remember, if you, and if you didn't, you can pull up the YouTube and watch it. Um, that a large section of the passage from last week was a poem with the, the highlight verse was Philippians 2.8, that he humbled himself, he, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So that was like, that was the main point of not only that section, but really sets the theme of the emphasis on humility and service exemplified by Jesus Christ that then is expanded on for a substantial part of the rest of this book. Jesus demonstrated humility. Uh, he was the example we are to follow, uh, trusting that uh, God uh, would exalt us even as God exalted Jesus. You know, he raised him from the dead and that every knee shall bow and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so because Jesus humbled himself, he positioned himself in the place where God could lift him up. And so that's the idea that Paul is saying that we likewise need to to follow Christ's example. And then he continues on by uh, sharing the example of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Everybody say, Epaphroditus! Epaphroditus. Now who's going to name their kid Epaphroditus? Come on. Good biblical name. (laughs) I was trying to think of a way to shorten that. Pappy? (laughs) Ro? Epaphro? (laughs) Bro. <laughs> so, uh, but he reinforces this theme of unity, humility, and service. First, we, we uh, looked at Jesus' example, and now we're going to look at Tim- the example of Timothy and the example of Epaphroditus. <clears throat> uh, it says in uh, chapter 2, 19, If the Lord Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. Then he can cheer me up by telling me how you are getting along. Uh, Paul's uh, purpose for sending Timothy was so that Timothy's report back to him, and you know, they had a mail service. Aren't you happy for the mail? Somebody say, happy for the mail. Okay. (laughs) They had mail back in the Roman days. And so, Timothy was going to go to Philippi, and just as Paul had written a letter, he would send a letter back, either through his mail service or through an individual traveler, to hear how they were doing. He, Paul had been locked up, I don't remember quite how long, uh, you know, we don't know for sure, but for a long time he'd been in prison, and previous to being in in prison he was um, traveling to Rome under a guard, and, uh, and so he'd been separated from the people he'd loved, and he wanted to be reconnected. Now, <clears throat> thankfully, I haven't been locked up, but we've had a season of being locked down, haven't we? <laughs> All right, and I just, I, when I read this, I, I just called to memory, not distant memory, actually just from a few days ago, in that I had the fortune of traveling to England uh, this past week to do the first in-person conference um, of the Harvest Alliance. Uh, And this is a guy, his name is Bob Kilpatrick. And Bob is a really good friend of mine. I've known him for, wow, probably 20 years at least. And uh, Bob is Scottish. Like he's really Scottish. 
In fact, when he talks, often I need someone to interpret because <laughs> his accent is so thick. I'm not going to try to uh, do an accent. I'm really bad at accents. I'll probably come out with a Mexican accent or something. But, but seriously. Uh, and so we've known each other for years, but we, we've been separated. Actually, the last time I saw Bob, I think, was in, back in 2018. Uh, and in uh, 2019, there was uh, a, a series of things that happened that prevented us from gathering. And then COVID hit, and, and, <clears throat> and w- w- the reason I share this is when I showed up, we had the, um, I did a church service on Sunday, and then we did a retreat, leaders retreat at a, re- uh, a nice hotel in a no- nearby town, and I walked up, and there was a few of them outside uh, fellowshipping, <clears throat> and when I walked up, Bob looked up at me, and he saw me. Bob was a bit older than I. In fact, I had the opportunity, his son came to the gathering, and I met his oldest son, <laughs> and his oldest son is only three years younger than me. You know, I, I'm like, Bob, Bob ages well. <laughs> I don't know how old Bob is, but he's got to be 20 years older than me, at least 16 or 18 years older than me. Uh, but he's, he's full of life, he's vibrant, and, uh, and, and when he saw me walking across uh, the walkway to approach them, you could just see him light up. And Bob, if you, if you watch this, it just it blessed my heart because he, he literally jumped and, and embraced me. And, you know, that was okay. But then he, like, really squeezed me, okay? And it, it got kind of awkward <laughs> for, like, a long time. He was so happy, and it, you know, it almost brought me to tears, and I realized, you know, he didn't actually say this. He didn't have to say it because we know each other. We love each other. Uh, uh, it would, it was, I was giving him joy, right? And he was giving me joy. We were reconnecting after years of separation, all right? And I realized, you know what? He, 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 he likely thought he'd never see me again because uh, the, the gatherings that we used to do, they ended. And then COVID hit, and as an elderly person, he like, how long can it be? And, and so he hugged me like I had come back from the dead. I'm serious, you know. And that blessed my heart. And so that reconnecting after being disconnected was it brought such a joy to both of us. And the whole the two days that we were together, it was like we kept talking about how good it was to see each other and looking forward to coming out of lockdown. And that's the kind of emotion that Paul was talking about. Remember, the overriding theme of Philippians is it's the letter of joy, even though it's written from a prison cell with, uh, by a man who's on death row. Okay? And in that situation, if he can have such joy and look for such joy uh, uh, and joy for others, how much more should we be able to be joyful and find joy in our circumstances? He goes on and says, begins his uh, talking about Timothy. He says, I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. You know, I think that everyone, if if they're honest with themselves, and this isn't a wrong thing, this is actually a good thing, we want to be like no one else in some aspect. We want to excel, right? And Timothy excelled. He was best at what mattered most, genuinely caring for others. He genuinely cared. That care that he had for others set him apart to the point where it's recorded in eternal scripture. Uh, What an honor to have that. The word genuinely is quite interesting in the Greek. Um, It means naturally or sincerely but I love how the commentator, uh, uh, James, James, Jameson, Faust, and ah, JFB, I can't remember how to pronounce their word names. Um, <clears throat> he puts in explaining what this, this word means in the, in, the, in the application to Timothy. It says, it was a case wherein the Spirit of God so changed a man's nature that to be natural was with him, Timothy, to be spiritual. All right? He genuinely cared. So he cared in such a way that it just came, 
the, that his natural, genuine state was to be spiritual, to be naturally spiritual, and that it was the act or the, the outcome of the influence of the Holy Spirit. How many have a nature, a human nature? You ever, you ever have to deal with it? All right, that's the genuine part of you. And sometimes we find, we discover, oh, there's parts of our nature that are not in alignment with God's nature. But in Timothy, he's saying it changed, something changed in him that made his, his genuine nature to be caring to the degree that he, he was above and beyond everyone else. How does this happen? How was Timothy, you know, it doesn't say how how he he was transformed. It just says he was. And you can read, you can pick up tidbits about Timothy's life. He was devoted to the word. And there's more we're going to share about Timothy here. But that cultivation in ourselves of this same transformation so that our nature what we just naturally are inclined to to be should be spiritual, should be caring, should be genuine for others, should be devoted to the things that matter most like Timothy. And and, and so Timothy is being set forth as as an example for us all. Caring only for themselves is contrasted with what matters most to Christ, what matters to Jesus. Don't you want to pursue the things that matter to Jesus? What are the things that matter to Jesus? Are they the things that are on the newscasts? Do you think? Why are so many people all frantic about what's on the news? Is that what matters to Jesus? Well, I think what matters to Jesus is clearly spelled out here. It's caring for others. It's it's caring for the welfare, the needs of those that Timothy was ministering to. Jesus demonstrated that, and we celebrated that in communion uh, by dying on the cross. Did he do it for himself? No. But he gave up everything to be nailed to that tree, to be Uh, 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 tortured, beaten, and then crucified, shedding his blood for your benefit. Say it, for my benefit. For my benefit. For the benefit of every man, woman, and child on planet Earth who will receive what he's willing to give. And if you're here and haven't accepted Jesus' death and, and received the gift of life that comes through receiving that, I encourage you, don't leave today without coming to the place where you say, yes, I believe that his death on the cross was for me. And he did that for my sake, and I could never satisfy the the requirements of God's justice, but Jesus did for me. All right, and so Jesus did it, and then Timothy followed Jesus' example, and this is uh, uh, what was explained, and, and Kathy touched on this last week, that not, er, this is what was earlier in the chapter, that we do nothing through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others. That's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. That's what, how Timothy lived, and that's what we are called to live as Christ followers. We need to excel in this. Right, to care for what matters most to Jesus, to be naturally spiritual. Naturally spiritual. All right. How do you do that? Holy Spirit in you wants to do that. All right. Is it hard work? Actually, it's probably giving up. <laughs> giving in to Jesus. Giving in. Jesus, right? There's a verse in the scripture that says, Christ in you the hope of glory, right? Where is Jesus right now in this room? In some way, in you, in me, in us. We need to let him out. (laughs) 
All right? Let Jesus be Jesus through us. Another place, John the Apostle says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You know what that means? That means that there is nothing in this world that can prevent you from living like this. All right? We interpret it as, oh, you know, there's, we're, we're under a tab of greater is he that's within us. We can, we, can, we can make it, we can endure. No, we can overcome! All right? There's nothing that can prevent you from caring for others. From giving up uh, your uh, desires for the sake of meeting the needs uh, of others. To live Christ-like. All right? It's embedded in us, okay? It's already in you if you're a believer. You just need to allow it to be uh, free in your life. To pursue it. To yield to it, like Justin said, to take time in soaking and in prayer and in scripture to allow Holy Spirit to change your, 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 not only your, your nature, but also how you uh, live out that nature. So here's the homework assignment. Are you ready, students? All right, this week, find ways that you can excel in this way. Find ways that you can care for others and put their needs before your needs. All right, that means you want to do one thing, but if you do something else, Others would benefit from it, so you're going to do that. It doesn't mean you neglect yourself completely, all right? But you find that the greatest joy in life is when you meet other people's needs, right? You establish those relationships, and it's relationships that actually bring us joy. And then look for someone who's doing this and commend them as Paul is commending Timothy. Point them out and say, you know, boy, they're doing such a great job. Kind of like Leah pointed out those who have helped. And that encourages, us, encourages all of us, doesn't it? And so find someone and say good things. I was talking to a checkout lady at, uh, I don't know if I told this story before, but uh, this just happened a few weeks ago. And she had, uh, she was, uh, I don't know, we were just chatting. <laughs> and uh, 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 she would said uh, uh, just a few days earlier, she was walking to her car after they'd closed the store. And they're closing still a little early, 9 o'clock, and so they usually close at 10. You know, but they've been doing that for two years now. <laughs> she was walking to her car, and someone pulled up, angry that the store was closed. And she was like, I'm sorry, this store closes at 9. And started cussing this clerk, like, blankety blank, like mad, screaming at her. And the clerk was like, hey, my ears is open 24 hours a day, just a few miles down the road. Let's not be like that. Let's <laughs> say, gosh, thank you, checkout lady or checkout person or uh, uh, wait staff. Thank you so much. Gratitude is so powerful. And commend people that are doing the good work and, and draw attention to them rather than yourself. All right, let's continue on. But you know how Timothy has proved himself like a son with his father. He has served with me in preaching the good news. I hope to send him to you just as soon as I find out what is going to happen to me here. And I have confidence from the Lord that I myself will come to see you soon. So Paul's explaining to them his intention, but he talks a little more about Timothy's example, that Timothy proved himself. He demonstrated Christ-like character, and he actually mentions three separate ways in which he does that. First, that is that genuine care, which we've already talked about, that uh, Timothy uh, uh, excelled in that. But then he talks about <clears throat> his relationship with Paul as a son with a father. And let me just tell you, <clears throat> I am in a new stage of life, my youngest son, this, this youngest, stand up, Lewis. <laughs> he gets his looks from me. <laughs> All right, sit down. <laughs> He's 20 years old. My youngest son is 20. You know, and so it's kind of like, that changes things. Right? I'm no longer, I'm in the stage of elder, okay? I'm an old guy. Um, and what, and so the things that impress me now, the things that uh, get my attention are different than they were when I was his age. 
maybe even 10 or 15 years ago. All right, and I think, this, I think I hear what Paul's saying here, is that there is an attribute that makes people stand out when uh, they, they're like a son to a father. When a young person acknowledges and is respectful of those who've gone before versus the young people uh, who may be in their physical and even their mental prime, you know, in many ways they're prime, but they don't respect, they don't realize that they're, they're actually walking a path that someone else has cleared for them. All right? And, and Paul says, hey, Timothy gets it. And another thing that was very common in their day that's not common in our day is that this reference is that a son would learn his livelihood from his father. If the father was a carpenter, the son would learn how to live, also how to make money, how to build a business from working with his father. He'd work in the family business or a farmer or whatever, a tradesman. He would learn that Paul, most likely, he was a maker of tents. He actually made tents and he'd sell them. There's no question that he learned that from his father. And so this, this idea is that he had this relationship of learning the trade with the intention of being the successor, that he was going to continue on after Paul was dead. And believe it or not, I think about this all the time. Like, I, I hope that what I've done in life has an influence after I'm dead. Because if the influence is only while I'm alive, frankly, I've wasted my time. I'm investing in the next generation. And that's what Paul's talking about here. But you need next generation. You need to be receptive. You need to latch on and realize this is an opportunity. Because the majority of people don't. They're so busy with their own life, they don't even pay attention. But Timothy stood out. He was like a son to a father. And then serving, and that word there is the same word that Paul used earlier describing himself, that he was a slave. He willingly gave up, Timothy gave up his rights for the purpose of serving Paul, with Paul in the gospel. All right? The priority was the preaching of Christ crucified. When I was in England, one of the things I said to the leaders, I'm like, guys, we don't need a new revelation. We don't need a new teaching. You know what they call new teachings? Thank you. They didn't get it. I was like, you know what they call? Heresy. All right, there's nothing new, right? This scripture is written solid, objective truth. What we need is a revelation of truths that have not changed for centuries and apply them into our lives, live them and preach them. That's what we need. And so the gospel is that, Jesus Christ, Christ crucified, our hope, our only hope that we live uh, a life as a follower of Christ, willing likewise to die for the furtherance of the gospel. And Timothy uh, exemplified that. Timothy embodied that. And Paul is calling him out and saying, this guy, he's someone's, he's an example you can follow. <clears throat> and so are we, I like how it uses the word prove. And sometimes, you know what? You need to prove it. Are we proving ourselves in this way? Where's the proof that you're living this way? Can someone else point and say, boy, you're doing this and you're doing that and you're doing that. And that shows that you're caring for others more than yourself. It, it shows that you're a slave to the gospel with others. It shows that you're being a son or a daughter following the footsteps of those who've gone before you. Are there ways that prove it? Like Timothy had ways. And I challenge you to, to do that. I think there are, all right? Uh, you're here because you're wanting to learn more. And that's, that in and of itself sets you apart. But let's continue. Let's go for it and be, uh, excel in these things. <clears throat> Philippians continuing on, verse 25 through 30. Meanwhile, I thought, so he's going to send Timothy, but right now he, he, he's sending Epaphroditus right away <clears throat> because for some reason Timothy wasn't able to go yet. He said, meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you he is a true brother, a co-worker, and a fellow soldier 
and he was your messenger to help me in my need. So who's this Epaphroditus guy? Um, I think it's a great little snippet into a, a person's life in the New Testament. A lot of people overlook his story and what's said of him, but I think it's really significant, and it's, it's worthy of our attention. A true brother. Again, another family term. Timothy was a son. Epaphroditus was a brother, probably because Epaphroditus was more Paul's age, and it would have been inappropriate to call him a son. He's, you know, I wouldn't call <coughs> uh, Bob Kilpatrick a son, uh, you know, uh, but our relationship, it's not like I'm his spiritual son. We're, we're really brothers, all right? And that hug was a brotherly love, uh, a brotherly hug of love. And so Epaphroditus was a brother to Paul. As uh, Christ followers, we're called to live in deep relationship. Hey, have your attention. Attention, please. Attention, please. We are approaching takeoff time. It's, uh, we appreciate everyone uh, fastening their seat belts, uh, lowering their tray, uh, putting up their tray tables, adjusting their seats to the upright position, and be in deep relationship with one another. In order to reach the uh, altitude that we will need to fly, you need to have a deep relationship with those that you are flying with. Let's all hug one another on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> No, they don't do that in planes. It's, it's the opposite. It's like, you, I'm, I'm, I'm all by myself. You don't exist. <laughs> well, in a, in a church body, listen, we need to have deep relationship. We're to do life together deeply. As sons, as brothers, mothers, and fathers. To do that, you need to open yourself up. Don't just come in like you're flying on an airplane. Be part of the family, all right? Co-workers, following Christ, doing church together means more than just a family reunion, all right? It's being on mission. Oscar Mike, how many know that term? <laughs> Nobody? Hey, you got to watch more army shows. On mission. On mission. We're doing something. We have purpose. And we're going to get it done. All right? And this is actually another level. I'd say a deeper level, a more significant level. You know, I have, have brothers. <laughs> you know? uh, but when you work with a brother and you're do, you have the same purpose and goals and you're putting your energy and your resources uh, toward the same purpose, that makes you even more deeply related. And that's what Christian community is supposed to be. And Paul's saying, this guy, Epaphroditus, is an example of that, right? And then a fellow soldier, not only willing to be together and to work together, but willing to fight together, not fight each other, but fight together, even die together. Wow. Paul said, this guy, he did that. And saints, this is who we are. Don't allow the media and the critics of Christianity to define Christianity to you. All right? Don't allow the world and the worldly influencers to define what Christianity is. Oh, Christianity, they're just so this, they're so that, they're, they're that, they're mean, they're bad, they're against everything. No! God's word defines Christianity and his spirit defines Christianity. We see it here. Someone who's willing to go the distance and deep relationship, genuine relationship, working together, fighting for, not against one another. This is what makes us the light of the world. This is how we influence and change the world. But if you listen to the accuser, then, you, then you'll be, uh, uh, you, you, the power's taken away. Listen to the truth. This is what Christianity is. This is what we're called to. This is who you are. Walk in it. So Epaphroditus had been sent to Paul and brought uh, Paul gifts from the church in Philippi uh, while he was in prison. And it really blessed him. And now, uh, and that was a demonstration of their love for Paul. And Paul's now 
uh, returning him home uh, with this letter, uh, most likely, and to establish, reestablish that relationship. He says, I'm sending him because he has, be- he has been longing to see you. He was very distressed that you heard he was ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him and also on me so that I would not have sorrow, uh, uh, not have one sorrow after another. And so this is interesting because we see an example of sickness in Scripture in a, in, a, in a way that is not normally portrayed. Okay? He just got sick. All right? It's not a story of a miraculous healing. It's not a story of someone cursed with a, a sickness because of sin. It's just like, he gets sick. And he was about to die. And remember, Paul had an incredible healing ministry. It was Paul that would touch uh, uh, handkerchiefs, and they'd take it to other towns, and they'd be healed, right? You know, and, uh, and when it was at, uh, Ephesus, that, that happened. There was a season in Paul's life where just everybody was getting healed. But there, Epaphroditus was with Paul, sick, and Paul, I'm sure, was praying for him. But you know what? He almost died. He just got sick to the point of death. <clears throat> and so we see a part of real life, you know, people have, uh, again, misunderstanding. Uh, disappointment is when, you're, when you have the wrong uh, uh, expectation. Uh, uh, you know, people get disillusioned, and I'm saying, I, I'd like to say that's good because you were believing an illusion. And so disillusion is when you remove the illusion. We don't have to have the illusion that, hey, everybody in, uh, becomes a Christian and there's, everybody gets healed. No, some people get sick. Some people die. And this almost happened to, to Paul's friend three weeks ago, right before, the week before I went to England. A friend I've known for at least 25 years. He's a pastor, powerful ministry, written many, many, many books. Quite famous, actually, for writing <clears throat> and a worship leader. He died of covid I wish he'd um, gotten the shot. He didn't. I don't know why. He's dead. And I've lost a few friends. Um, I sorrow when I lose someone, whether it's COVID or heart attack or car wreck. We all die, folks. All right? Uh, But here we have a picture of someone who pushed through, and he didn't give up. I've had friends, I don't know if you remember, some of you may remember Mark, Mark Jevert, um, <clears throat> who helped us a few years ago, and he's, he's shared some things with the 320. He was close to death. He was early COVID. Uh, he was in the hospital. He couldn't walk for months. And I just saw him a few months ago, and he's completely recovered and filled with energy, and it's great. I'm like, we're survivors, yay! But regardless of the outcome, like Paul, we, we put our trust in God, right? And so we see just an example of someone getting sick, someone recovering, and the giving of thanks. And then we see Epaphroditus recover and then get back on mission, all right? He, he continued to do the work of being a companion, being a laborer, and being a fellow soldier. He got back to work after he got off his sick bed. And then Paul, uh, last uh, few verses here, it says, so I am all the more anxious. Paul says, I am anxious <laughs> to send him back to you, for I know uh, you will be glad. It will bring you joy, gospel joy, and I will not be so worried about you. Welcome him with Christian love and with great joy and give him the honor that people like him deserve, for he risked his life for the work of Christ. And he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't uh, do from far away. So another place where Paul's saying Epaphroditus was caring for my needs above his own, exemplifying the principle of humility, unity, and service uh, to the point of death. And Paul says, you need to honor this guy and and rejoice with him. But I like how Paul mentions his anxiety and his worry. Did you catch that? Do you know what he says in Philippians chapter 4? Anybody remember 4? I forget what verse it is. 4.1, four, four is it? Be anxious for nothing in the same letter. Is it four, verse 6? 
Be anxious for nothing, but in all things in prayer and, and thankfulness, you know, give your, make your request known to God. <clears throat> and so Paul is actually, and, and scholars, uh, if you study the life of Paul, he dealt with anxiety, he dealt with depression, he dealt with uh, a, a, all kinds of uh, issues in his life. He was a real person. He had strong emotions. And, and here he says he's anxious for them, and he worries about them, and he needs help. And so again, it brings balance to what we'll study in a few weeks when we talk about being anxious for nothing. It doesn't mean that we don't have anxiety. It means that we deal with it properly, right? And Epaphroditus was to be welcomed with love, with joy and honor because he risked his life. Another comparison, as I said earlier, just a minute ago, of his willingness to give all for the sake of others, to, to do what, Jesus, what matters to Jesus. And so it's, it's an example like Timothy, like Paul himself, and like Jesus to do what matters. And that's who we are. That's what we're called to. Following Christ means uh, uh, we give it all. We hold nothing back, not for personal gain or to become famous, right? To become a Christian celebrity, which in my opinion is an oxymoron. You, you can't be, a, I mean, sure there's famous Christians, but... Uh, the, the purpose of Christianity is not to be uh, famous or to, uh, to draw attention to yourself. It's quite the opposite. It's to care for others and to draw attention to Jesus. Roland Baker, Heidi and Roland Baker are missionaries, and if anyone can, can say something like this, it's them because they have served and they continue to live in Mo, uh, Mozambique even though the base is evacuated because there's a rebel army out and one of their goals is to kill Heidi and Roland Baker because they're, it's a Muslim extremist uh, army trying to um, overthrow the Mozambican government. Uh, Heidi and Roland are, 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 are still at the base and continuing to serve. I actually heard them speak by Zoom <coughs> on a conference call just a few months ago um, and they're, they're continuing to do the, the work of the gospel wherever they are. But he posted this <coughs> a few weeks ago. Uh, and this is a quote from um, this famous old guy from the 1700s. <laughs> to the Mor- Moravian, uh, Moravian, Moravian missionaries. The Moravians were actually the first Protestants. Uh, years, decades before Martin Luther led the, the Protestant Reformation, they were already uh, following the same precepts. And, and, and it kind of like it was the, the, the start of a momentum. They're known for uh, prayer and they're known for missions. And they literally sent missionaries out throughout all of the world. But he was charging these missionaries before they left uh, the base and be sent to their destinations. He said, the missionary uh, must seek nothing for himself, no seat of honor or hope of fame. Be content to suffer, die, and be forgotten. And I would say the Christian must seek nothing for him or herself, no seat of honor or hope for fame but to be content to suffer, die, and be forgotten. Because when we live that way, we put our trust in Jesus Christ who will lift us up. If you humble yourself, God will exalt you. You put your trust and you're making an investment into eternity and you're believing that God will reward you. I challenge you, let's live by that standard. Could you come and close the service? Thank you, folks.